Good morning, everybody. So good to be here uh, with you on July 8. I can't believe how fast summer is flying by. Can you believe it? Last Sunday, we had an incredible uh, time down at Barton Springs at Zilker Park, and we baptized 33 people. I, it was crazy. I, I don't have time to tell you the story now, but I will tell some stories from that day in the next few weeks. But I'm just so grateful that God is working. Like, like really what our faith is all about is that we believe the Holy Spirit is active. He is, when we, say, when we talk about the presence of God, what we mean is God is present and active among us around us, co collaborating with us, and all we're trying to do is collaborate with him. Do you get that? It's good. Uh, I want you to turn in your Bibles to uh, Matthew chapter 18. That's where we're going to start today. If you need message notes, the ushers have them, and uh, they will get them to you. Just raise your hand. They have pens and, and all that stuff. Two weeks ago, we launched a new series called I Will Survive, How to Make It Through a Bad Day. And we're talking about bad days. And uh, sometimes it's really tough to make it through a bad day. We talked last week, uh, the two weeks ago, about how important it is to believe the right things about God, to believe the right things about who you are and to believe the right things about the world around us. And we talked about how pivotal that is for you to have a proper view of God, a proper view of yourself, and a proper view of what's going on in the world so that you can have faith. And so if you want to listen to that podcast, you can go to onechapel.com and find it there. And during this series, we're going we're gonna to kind of unpack what it takes to make it through a bad day. And we'll talk about different subjects as we go through it. Um, you know, sometimes, sometimes bad things just happen, and we're trying to figure out how to make it through it. We're trying to figure out how to explain it. Sometimes we just like, whose fault is this? We're trying to figure out what happened, why this happened, and sometimes we just spin our wheels kind of going through that why question, when in reality, there are some really important solutions that the scripture gives us to understand what it takes to get through that bad day, because explaining it is really half the battle, right? Like figuring, uh, figuring out what it is that God wants from us and for us is really part of the thing. So in that spirit, the following are actual statements from insurance forms. People filling out insurance forms where car drivers, right? People who are driving a car and had a wreck, they're attempting to summarize the details of the bad things that happened to them. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever heard this kind of thing before, but they have to, they, what they do is they fill out this insurance form and they have to do it in the fewest amount of words. And so they're, they're, they're writing in these little spaces, fewest amount of words. Here's, here's the first one. It says, coming home, I drove into the wrong house and collided with a tree I don't have. <laughs> the other, here's another one. The other car collided with mine without giving warning of its intention. Number three, I thought my window was down, but I found out it was up when I put my head through it. <laughs> <That's> awesome. <laughs> Number four, a truck backed through my windshield into my wife's face. <laughs> it's so fu oh, You people, come on. Oh, that's so terrible. This is funny. <laughs> you don't say a truck backed into my wife's face. Anyway, number five, a pedestrian hit me and went under my car. <laughs> that is terrible. I'll admit that that is terrible. Six, I pulled away from the side of the road, glanced at my mother-in-law, and headed over the embankment. <laughs> Number seven, I attempted to kill a fly, and I drove into a telephone pole. I like this one. I had been driving for 40 years when I fell asleep at the wheel and had an accident. <laughs> Here's another one. I was on my way to the doctor with rear end trouble and my universal joint gave way. 
causing me to have an accident. <laughs> All right. I, that shouldn't break me up that much. I did read these earlier. Um, <clears throat> number 10, an invisible car came out of nowhere, struck my car, and vanished. <laughs> I told the police that I was not injured, but on removing my hat, found that I had a fractured skull. <laughs> okay, last one. The telephone pole was approaching. I was attempting to swerve out of its way when it struck my front end. <laughs> Sometimes we try so hard to try to sort of explain everything that's happening around us. We we actually come to the wrong conclusions. And I think so often we, we come to the wrong conclusions about the bad days that we're having. And uh, today we're going to talk about a, an idea that really has to do with the reason for many of our bad days. And the reason for many of our bad days are other people. <laughs> that Someone has hurt us. Someone's done something to us. Um, somebody's wounded us. And, and, and the, the truth is, for all of us, I mean, we've all had bad days, and we know people who are having bad days. You may have heard the term, hurt people hurt people, and are easily hurt by others. And it's really true. There's a lot of people walking around with wounds kind of gaping open and, and hurt in their lives, and they end up hurting us. Sometimes relationships crumble. Marriages fall apart. Families get into a, 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 a way of interacting with each other that's damaging, so damaging. And across our nation, there is a a real epidemic of people who are battling depression and discouragement and they don't know how to overcome it because they don't have people in their lives who are helping them. They just have hurt. Hurt that's coming at them from every which way. Two weeks ago I read these statistics. I think they're incredibly challenging for us. It's recently been reported in a new study from the U.S. Centers for Disease Control Prevention that suicides are up sharply since 1999. Suicide rates rose in all but one state in the United States and are up at least 30% in half of the states. Think of that. 30% in half of the states over the last several years. Near, this is an incredible statistic. Nearly 45,000 suicides occurred in the U.S. in 2016. More than twice the number of homicides, making it the 10th leading cause of death. Among people ages 15 to 34, suicide is the second leading cause of death. That's, that's an incredible stat. How can this be? We got to help people figure out how to deal with their bad days. And, and I, I think it's so important that we don't minimize the seriousness of the struggle. I mean, I think it's good to laugh about some of these, some of these things that, that people write in on their insurance claims, but I, but I also want us to zero in on what's really going on in our society because it is your job and my job to help bring healing to people, to help them, help them see that there is a way forward, to believe that there is a God who loves them and cares about them. To help them not come to the wrong conclusion. It appears to me that we are less equipped maybe than ever before in our culture to deal with bad days. Um, we are surprised, we're shocked, we're upset, we're frustrated, we're freaked out by things that happen. We are disheartened when our days don't go the way they should. And I, I'm so glad that we have someone who can help us see it clearly. His name is Jesus. Because Jesus understands 
what we're facing because he faced it himself. Here's what Hebrews 12.2 says. I think it's in your message notes if you want to follow along. It says, keep your eyes on Jesus who both began and finished this race we're in. Study how he did it. I love that little phrase. Because he never lost sight of where he was headed. That exhilarating finish in and with God, he could put up with anything along the way. Cross, shame, whatever. And now he's there in the place of honor right alongside God. You see, Jesus shows us the way to live. He shows us the perspective we should have. There is no greater authority on a bad day than Jesus himself. And the scriptures are very clear that, that people are going to get hurt. There are offenses that are going to happen in this world that we live in, this broken planet that we all inhabit. Matthew 24, 10 says, and then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. This is part of the brokenness of our world. This is part of the reason Jesus came, is to bring his kingdom of healing and love and grace and mercy. Luke 17 says, then he said to his disciples, it is, it is impossible that no offenses should come. They're coming. They're coming for you. They're coming for others. And I think we need to learn this. If you think about betrayal, right? Jesus experienced betrayal. Judas betrayed him. Judas gave him up to his accusers. False accusations. Jesus experienced the Jews accusing him of trying to topple the Roman Empire. That's really what led him to the cross. That's what Pontius Pilate, that's why he said, okay, crucify him. Rejection. Jesus experienced rejection. People watched his miracles. They saw incredible things happen and rejected him. Abuse. Jesus was violently abused. He understands it. Humiliation. Jesus was hung on a cross naked, with no dignity left. He understands. Jesus experienced it all. Everything you've experienced and more. Everything I've experienced and more. Because on the worst day, think about this, on the worst day of Jesus' life, hanging on a cross, bruised, bloodied, dying, Jesus said these words, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. Think about that. Today I want to talk to you about forgiveness. I want to talk to you about the challenges and the miracle of living in a way that, that you forgive those who are trying to ruin your life. Sometimes as a bad day appears, it's caused by others and we must choose to forgive them so that we will not let them ruin our lives. I think it was George Washington Carver who said, I will never let another man ruin my life by making me hate him. And I, and I, and I think the, that Jesus has some authority on this. And so let's jump into Matthew 18, and we're going to read a little story that Jesus is telling about an unmerciful servant. Verse 21 in Matthew 18 says, Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? I love Peter. He is just the best. Right? He's like, so Jesus, I got a good question for you. Like, I, I, I think I know the answer, but like how many times? And Jesus has just been talking about offenses. If you read the context, he's just been talking about how to work out issues and sinfulness and offenses between people. And Peter says, well, so if this happens, like how many times should I do that? Like, can you give me a number? Because like up to seven times? Because seven's a lot. That's a lot of times. Verse 22, Jesus answered, I tell you not seven times, but 77 times, or 70 times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. Now, notice Jesus goes right into his story, and he begins to illustrate his point. So the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. And since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had 
be sold to repay the debt. And at this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me, and I will pay it back. But he refused. And instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. And when the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said, I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Really incredible story. Jesus speaking about forgiveness. Just a few things about this. Number one, I think Jesus in this story is trying to help his disciples understand what forgiveness is. Is it an act? Is it a state of mind? Is it what what is it? How do you how do you do it? I believe that Jesus is teaching here when Peter says, should I forgive up to seven times? That Jesus like does something absurd and says 70 times seven. I don't think Jesus meant 490. It's like, that's absurd because 490, I've counted them all. I've been keeping a record. If you keep a record of somebody hurting you 490 times, you've already lost. Jesus is not saying 490 is the line. He's saying that forgiveness is a predisposition for the Christian. It's a, it's a context. It's a predisposition he was saying, you got to make it your way of life. you gotta, you got to make it your, your go-to. This is, this is what you do. This is who you are. This is, this is what helps define you. He's saying forgiveness is mandatory here, especially as he gets to the end of the story and kind of makes the, the connection between our Heavenly Father and us. And, and, and we see this, this man in this story who owes all this money, and he begs and pleads that the master will not punish him. He wants to not go to jail, and he, he wants a chance. Check this out. He wants a chance to pay him back even though he hasn't up to now. And the master in the story does something incredible, and I want you to notice it. The master in the story doesn't just say, oh, you have more time to pay. The, the master didn't say, I have this 0% interest deal for you. <laughs> if you just sign right here, <laughs> that's a death trap, by the way. Don't ever do it. I've done it many times. It's awful. <laughs> Jesus is, is telling the story. And he, the master actually says, okay, I forgive the whole debt. Just go. You don't even have to pay it back. The man was so astounded, so amazed, so joyful, s felt so light and airy that he went right out and tried to get 10 bucks from his friend. What's wrong with that picture? You see, unforgiveness... It's like drink, drinking poison and hoping that somebody else will drop dead. <laughs> right? It's, 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 it's something that gets inside of us, and it kills us. It destroys our soul. Jesus is saying you've got to make forgiveness your lifestyle. And you guys, consider this. Consider this. What if forgiveness is not just kind of a, a pansy way of you know, dealing with hurts, kind of a, oh, I'll just, I'll just forgive them. Um, what, it, what, if it's, what if it is a way of actually resisting the work of the enemy in your own life? What if it's, what if forgiveness is more of a 
kind of a bad to the bone, hardcore Jesus thing. Right? What if, what if, it's, what if it's more like that than, oh, I just want to be, for, I want to forgive them. <laughs> what if forgiveness is not just some kind of wimpy way to be nice to mean people, <laughs> but is instead a supernatural gift from God to overcome sin and to defeat evil? What if that's what forgiveness is? Then it starts to make sense why this story gets so serious at the end. Why does Jesus make this connection to, oh my gosh, this is how your heavenly father will treat you if you can't, if you don't, if you're not willing. Number two, forgiveness flows from being forgiven. And I think the problem in the story is the guy who had been forgiven didn't realize it. He, it hadn't settled on him. He, it hadn't become a predisposition for him yet. He, hadn't under, he didn't understand what was really going on in his life. He didn't realize that he was out from under the burden. And I think that's true for so many of us, that we live under some kind of weird idea of a burden of sin, and I'm just a sinner, I'm just oh, I'm saved by grace, but I'm really a sinner, but I'm really trying hard, but I'm... Uh. And we don't have a revelation of the gospel and the good news, which means Jesus has taken your sins, the weight, the pain, the past, the failure, the foolishness. He's taken it, and he's freeing you from it. Like the story Jesus tells, the guy's free from this huge debt, but goes out and tries to get money from some other guy who was still thinking he was in debt. I think there's a revelation, and it's forgiveness flows from understanding that you are forgiven. We, name, we, name, we may not be able or willing to forgive other people if we don't understand how much we've been forgiven. Choosing to forgive is really an admission of our own need to repent, right? It's really an admission of, oh, yeah, I've needed to be forgiven, and I've been forgiven, and now I'm going to forgive. C.S. Lewis says, to be a Christian means to forgive the inexcusable because God has forgiven the inexcusable in me. Number three, forgiveness is central to our relationship with God. Forgiveness is central to our relationship with God because it defines how we function with him, how we live with him, what we, th what we think of him, how we relate. Everybody say relate. relate. How we relate to God. Jesus, is our he Jesus says that our heavenly Father will not forgive us if his forgiveness doesn't flow through us. See, you're not a container of forgiveness and love and mercy. You're a vessel of forgiveness, love, and mercy. You were made to pour it out. You're like a, a pitcher of sweet tea on a hundred degree day in Austin. And God has poured all this sweetness and wonder and beauty. <laughs> that beautiful sweet tea color with ice cubes melting into the sun is bearing down on you. And there's iced tea poured in this pitcher. What a waste if it's just sitting there. What a waste. Everybody's like, I'm thirsty. <laughs> Need something to drink. You're made to be poured out. I think that's what forgiveness is. Forgiveness is being filled up so much that it, that it overflows. But you have to have a revelation. And, and here's what I, I think you and I have to believe. Because forgiveness is essentially releasing the person who's hurt us from our judgment. 
releasing the person from our judgment to God's judgment. God's perfect judgment, recognizing that God's just nature is so much better than our nature. Here's what I want you to see. God takes account of all hurt and injustice in our lives. Now, I'm going somewhere with this. God takes account. He's collecting. He's watching. He's with you. He knows your story. He is the one counting. He's the only one who can. If you count, it destroys you. If you count up all the injustice, you get to 490, you're toast. God's the only one who has the, the glory, the greatness, the strength to take account of every injustice and every hurt in your life. Now, you say, why is that important, Pastor Ross? Well, read Psalm 9, 7 through 9. It says, the Lord reigns forever. He has established his throne for judgment he will judge the world in righteousness. He will govern the people with justice. The Lord is a refuge. Everybody say refuge. He is a refuge for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. Romans 12, 19 says, Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, It is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. See, God is the only one who has the power, the strength to be able to wield true justice. You and I will mess it up. And so there is a day. See, for every Christian, for everybody who believes in who God is, everybody who relates to him, there is a, a way in which we have confidence and faith that there is a day coming when perfect justice will be revealed. You and I don't need revenge if we know perfect justice is coming. If you don't believe perfect justice is coming, then you've got to get it all now. You've got to exact revenge on the people who've hurt you. You've got to get them back. You've got to make sure they know who's right and who's wrong. We live in a culture where everybody wants to be right, where Twitter wars explode. <laughs> based on who's right and who's wrong. Listen, it is in us as humans, and, but as Christians, we are redeemed. We've, we've experienced this forgiveness, this mercy, and, and you don't have to be right about everything. <laughs> what is Pastor Ross saying today? What are you saying? We're right. We're the ones who are right. Are we? See, we serve a God who takes account of every hurt. And he is the one who can heal every hurt. He's also the one who can exact justice in the way that is perfect. So how do we do this? I, I, I think that forgiveness comes out of us. And, it, and, and like I described, it overflows from receiving it from God routinely, consistently. And I think it is, a, it is the context for our lives. And, but I think so often it's, it's easy for us to like boil forgiveness down to uh, just one little act. Oh, I forgave him. It's over. Sadly, I will tell you that I think forgiving others is a, more of a process. I've had some bad days in my life. My parents divorced when I was 17 years old. The story behind it, some of you know this, I'll just visit it briefly, but my mom disappeared for three months. Just one day, just disappeared. Her and dad were having some trouble. We didn't know where she, where she was. She took my little brother, Brent, with her. It was a bad day. I remember that day. I have a vivid memory of it. And there was a process by which we figured out what was really happening and how, how hurt she was. And, how, and our relationship has been repaired and healed over many, many years. But there was a season in my life for many years where I knew I needed to decide to forgive her. 
And so I did. Because that's the first step. But I, I kept realizing that over and over again, something would come up. A memory. Another thing that would happen. And I'd be so mad. And it was a whole family thing. It wasn't just my mom. It was like, you know, your, your dad, you're trying to figure out at 17 years old, you know, in my 20s, I was just working through this process of why do these bad things happen to me and what is this all about and what is my response? And, I, and so I know that the first step is to forgive. And you can write that in your notes. I know the first step is to forgive, but you have to understand that forgiveness is a decision, but healing is a process. Forgiveness is a decision. You can do it by faith. You can release somebody from your judgment. You can release them to God's perfect judgment. You can let them go. And in that way, you begin the healing process. But I would have to revisit that thing over and over again and forgive and sadly make the decision to forgive again. Well, Pastor Ross, aren't you, you weren't working and walking in very much faith, were you? Uh, I don't know. I just knew that I was angry again, and I had to decide to do what was right, to obey the scriptures, to let Jesus fill my heart with his forgiveness for my own inexcusable actions so I could forgive others for theirs. Matthew 6, 12, Jesus is teaching his disciples how to pray, and he says, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. See, this thing with forgiveness, it's intertwined. There's something that God does with us, and then we do with others. Now, let me highlight. It's in your message notes. I'm just going to read it real quick. Forgiveness is not. Here's what it's not. Here's what I'm not talking about. Excusing the wrong or denying punishment for the wrong that was done. I'm not, I'm not excusing wrong things or denying punishment. And especially in cases of, of, of traumatic and dramatic abuse, it is so important for me to clarify what I'm talking about here because I don't want anyone to go from this place with thinking that I just said, well, you just need to forgive them and get over it. When we say those kinds of things to victims of traumatic, uh, I'm all about the gray, she's the black and white, it's awesome. We work together really well <laughs> most of the time. But one of her famous phrases in our family is, if they would just apologize, then I could forgive them. I don't think that's scriptural, baby. <laughs> but what her point is, is it makes it so much easier to forgive. But it's actually not necessary. It's not based on fairness or apologies. A f it, forgiveness is not a feeling. Forgiveness is not forgetting. It's not forgetting. You have your story. In fact, if you for try to forget your story, it will mess with you. If you try to eliminate, seal off, and wall off the past, it leaves a, sto a story that God wants to use for your benefit and his glory off the table. It's not forgetting. It's... It's not trust. Forgiveness is not entering into trust again. You don't have to trust someone to forgive them. Here's what forgiveness is. It is a choice. It is an act of faith toward God. It allows for a response to be determined by him. It is a dismissal of debt that releases your resentment. It is yielding your right to extract punishment for the injustice done. Get that? It is yielding your right. Oh, Pastor Ross, I have the right. That, that, that was so bad what was done to me. I, I should have the right to extract punishment. As a Christian, you leave that punishment to God himself, and we have a, a system within our country, a court system, a justice system that is imperfect but tries to establish punishment for those who have violated others. Sometimes it works, sometimes it does not. 
Forgiveness is transferring the penalty and the determination of sentence to God. And forgiveness is a doorway to reconciliation. So, Pastor Ross, okay, you're telling me all this stuff. This is great. This is good material. I need this in my life. But how do I do it? How do I do it? Here it is. Three things. I think the way you start down this road, I think the way you work through this process of forgiveness of those who've hurt you is, number one, you pray for them. You pray for them. <laughs> you know, it's really hard to keep hating someone that you pray for all the time. When you pray for someone, I had a, I had a story of a boss that I had, and he was so rude and so mean, and I just, oh, I was so mad at him all the time, and I just wanted to quit, but I couldn't quit. And I felt like the Lord was asking me to pray for him. And something happened in my relationship with that boss. Because I prayed for him every day. Number two, you've got to bless him. I think, I think there's something that happens. You can make the decision to bless people who have hurt you or who are trying to ruin your life. In fact, this is what Jesus calls us to. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't read the scripture. Matthew 5, 34 through 44 says, You have heard it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Pray for those who persecute you. That's what Jesus said. Luke 6 says, in verse 27, it says, But I tell you who hear me, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. Whoa! What is this? Some of you are sitting here like, oh, well, those are nice Sunday school lessons, Pastor Ross. But I live in the real world. I don't live in the church world. I live in the real world where people are mean and cruel. Yet yeah, Jesus lived in the most brutal day of, a, of, of human history where they perfected a way to torment and kill people on wooden beams, hanging for days, creating fear and proving for everyone who was in charge. This is the day Jesus lived in. Number three, I think we have, uh, here, well, but before I get to number three, here's the thing. I think what we, what Jesus is suggesting here is that when somebody comes to us with a hurt, with something that hurts us, what is so powerful in the kingdom of God is when we respond with the opposite spirit. I want you to write that down in your notes. There's no little space for it, but you should write it in. When someone hurts you, when someone's mean to you, when somebody says something stupid to you, when somebody says something unthinking and it really hurts because you're sensitive about it, you know what you should do? You know what you and I are called to do? You know what we have the Holy Spirit inside of us for is so that we can respond in the opposite spirit. And I promise you, when you do things like that, sometimes it just breaks it wide open. Sometimes there's a, there's a, a way in which it affects the other person and Jesus begins to, to be revealed. Sometimes it just stops the other person from picking on you. Because it's no fun anymore. Because you're like responding in the opposite spirit. I, my kids, I don't know what this is. But they feed each other. By their routine hurts and wounds on each other. My, especially my two youngest boys, they like punch each other and they push each other. They'll just be walking by. Well, my, like Ethan will be walking by Owen, he'll just go boom. And then Owen will go, oh, 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 oh why, why, did, why do you do that? And then it, it's so funny because that's exactly what Ethan is looking for. Like make a big deal out of it. Make it, this is awesome. See how strong I am? Boom. If Owen ignores it and just moves on, it's no fun. Ethan stops doing it. I know all the great lessons of life are from kindergarten. <laughs> all right, I'm going to fill in the last few blanks. Step two, this is forgive. Oh, sorry, number three, number three, value them. You've got to value them. Here's what 2 Corinthians says. It says, our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory. What? Light and momentary? Tr you mean these people are our light and momentary troubles? <laughs> what? These people that are bothering us and hurting us and wounding us? What, what, is, what? How can that be? I have to value? Here's what you have to do. You have to value. Because here's the thing. 
they're loved by God too. But more, imp- more importantly, more importantly, what you can value them for is God's work in your life. Because every person, every, every hurt, every wound, there is something God wants to do to create good out of it. He wants to produce something in you. I promise you, he didn't cause it. There's enough sin and destruction and evil in the world. He doesn't have to manufacture any of that stuff, right? But he wants to take whatever has happened to you, and he wants to reshape it and mold it into something that is so good for you and me. It's, you can value them for being an instrument because every annoying person is an opportunity. <laughs> Hate to tell you, they're an opportunity for God's work in your life. All right, step two. Not only do you forgive as the first step, but then there's a reconciliation process. And we talked about this last week. 2 Corinthians 5 talks about that we are, have received the ministry of reconciliation, that Jesus himself, God himself is reconciling the world to himself. We talked about this two weeks ago. I'm not going to spend time on it now, but, but reconciliation is something we've received as a ministry. God is reconciling, putting the world back together the way it was and the way it should be, and we're collaborators with him in that. This passage says we are ambassadors with him. And so reconciling means to say the same thing. Reconciliation means to say the same thing. If you, if you go down in your bank book and you, and you look at the bank statement, right, and you do that and you come down and you're trying to justify, you're trying to reconcile the numbers, when you get down to the bottom and they, the numbers are the same, that means you've reconciled. You say the same thing. Now, let me tell you that sometimes reconciliation is hard to go through. It's a very difficult process. But if forgiveness is mandatory, reconciliation must be a possibility because it's our calling. And so if the other person's willing to reconcile, I think as a Christian, you have to be willing. Now, timing is up to you. You don't have to do what other people always tell you you have to do. But I think reconciliation is something that we need to be willing to go through. And it looks something like this. Well, no, you said this. No, I did not. Yes, you did. I heard you say it. And here's when you said it. Well, I didn't mean to say that. Well, I, what I meant was, well, you didn't say that because what you meant didn't come through, right? This is, this is a mini version of reconciliation. And sometimes reconciliation takes months, years when the violation is bad enough. But please don't misunderstand. Reconciliation is an important part of, of every process of forgiveness. Because, and why is reconciliation so important? Because God wants people to be together, not divided. That's a very big thing with God, and especially for Christians. And this is true, we often judge ourselves by our own motives and we judge others by their behaviors. <laughs> you ever notice that? We, ju- we have to judge ourselves by our motives and judge others by their behaviors. Look, this is what reconciliation is about. We kind of get confused about our, our motives and, and what's going on inside of us. Reconciliation is not negotiating. It is a willingness to submit to a process of discussion that, with the intent to understand. There may be disagreements as you work through it. There may be moments of challenge and tremendous amounts of listening. In fact, there are two really important things, requirements for reconciliation. Here they are. It is listening. See, we always want to talk about our our part. Listening and patience. (sighs) Hate it for you. Why? Because why do we need listening and patience? Because hurt people often need time to speak or to listen and and process their feelings and their questions. Reconciliation is a profound commitment, but it is the very process that leads to deeper repentance when when you realize that you've hurt somebody. It is the process that leads to deeper repentance for the person who's wounded you. Step three is restore. There's forgive, reconcile, and restore. Now, if forgiveness is mandatory, 
And reconciliation is a calling we must be open to. Restoration sometimes is less likely to happen because it's not mandatory. It depends on two people making decisions. Sometimes you try to reconcile and you can't. Reconciliation is not mandatory. Forgiveness is mandatory. Reconciliation is not mandatory, but it is. We have to be open to it. Restoration is what God's super interested in because he wants to restore and make all things new. But sometimes it's impossible. If in the case of a, a father who's passed away who abused his kids, there may be no chance for restoration. But you can still go through the, the steps, the decisions of forgiveness and, and relinquishing him from your judgment to God's judgment. Restoration is something God is deeply interested in, but it's not always possible. Restoration does not mean things will go back to the way they were. If you think about it, to restore a car means to make it as good or better than it was. If you restore a house, you renovate a house, there is something that you make it better than it was. Because what restoration is, restoration is the decision to re-engage in a trusting relationship again. And sometimes that's not possible. Sometimes you don't even want that, and it, is, and it is not something God will force you to do. But since we are people of faith, since we are people of miracles, we should always know that God is interested in restoring all things. Close your eyes and bow your heads. I want you to just listen to the Holy Spirit as he speaks to you about where you are on forgiveness and what, you, what your experience has been. And I want you to hold in your mind that person who has hurt you. Because this is a moment where you can begin the process. You can begin the journey today. You can decide. And you can decide because you're going to come to the table of the Lord the communion table where he himself is represented as the one who forgave you. The bread represents his brokenness so that you could be healed. The cup represents his blood so that you could be forgiven. Would you come to this table and receive provision? Would you come to the table and receive the bounty the more than enough provision so that forgiveness can pour into your soul and then can spill out towards others. Would you be willing to do that this morning? I want you to hold that person in your mind and I want you to fight the enemy and his schemes to destroy your heart by choosing to forgive. Father, we come to this table and we ask you to work in our hearts, work in our lives. Do what only you can do. Would you lead us? Would you guide us? Would you forgive us? And would you begin your healing process in our lives? In Jesus' name.